Well, good morning. We're in the Fairhope Library, Fairhope Alabama Library. I'm Bob Jill. I'm going to get to interview a patriot, Mr. Robert Hole, born 1921, the day before Christmas. He's 1224. Uh, retired uh, lieutenant colonel from the Marine Corps, a Marine aviator. Uh, it's my pleasure to see you, sir. Thank you. Uh, important things that uh, we talked about. Well, I had to buy you lunch the other day when I talked to you, and uh, Very good. today you're on. Uh, you have to buy your own. <laughs> but uh, we had a good lunch meeting, and you told me you had 14 medals and ribbons that you had acquired in the period of time. I think from 1942 to 1964, you were. A career Marine. Correct. Uh, if you would, I, and I'll, uh, excuse me if I interrupt you along the way, but uh, kind of tell me how you became a Marine aviator. I'm an Air Force guy, so a pilot is what I know. But tell me how you became a Marine aviator. Well, uh, I got in about the time that the Marines were down in Guadalcanal uh, shooting things down, and I I always wanted to be an aviator, so I made sure I had about 200 and something hours flight time before, and I knew I didn't want to be drafted. <laughs> so I, I set my goals, and uh, naturally I was a uh, naval aviator first. The, uh, you went through all the naval flight school, different f flying areas that we had to go to, like in one E-Base in St. Louis, and uh, uh, I even had, had to go to a place in, in, in uh, Fort Worth, which was a, uh, we were waiting for the Navy to build all their schools, so they... I, I don't, uh, don't want to interrupt too much here, but you told me that you went to the University of Georgia. That's right. At uh, flight school, and I, I thought that was so interesting. And you told me uh, TCU or yeah, somebody in Texas. Texas Christian, I had yeah. to fly little airplanes until they got schools ready for her. So I got in right, out, right after the war started, so... Uh, what did you learn to fly in? I learned to fly in a lot of airplanes. In fact, it's accumulated flying time in the Navy Marine Corps. Was, uh, actually, Marine Corps is part of the Navy. Uh, we fly off carriers and what have you. And so uh, I, I got to go to the University of Georgia, the same school that my Present wife graduated oh. from, and they they, uh, they took over the whole school except a little bitty place up in the uh, northwest corner of the campus, and uh, there was a, a, a lot of us there. About 640 went to a battalion, so uh, uh, it was all ground school. They say you're going to get the equivalent of four years of college because we're going to take out all that small stuff and concentrate on making you meteorologists and, and what have you. And so uh, that's where I went to pre flight school. Everybody in the Navy uh, had to go through pre flight school. Then we went to E Base in St. Louis, flew Stearman's. Is we call them yellow perils, <laughs> and uh, came back to Pensacola and uh, flew uh, trainer planes, and uh, then we went to an operational squadron, and I was in Jacksonville, Florida, and we flew the planes we were going to fly in combat, and that was an interesting thing because. Uh, we got there, we were flying wildcats, which mm -hmm. uh, far, uh, the zeros was far superior than a wildcat of that name. But uh, the day I was commissioned, 
I was in the upper 10 percent of the class, and it said, if you want to go into the Marine Corps, and uh, you can get in the Marine Corps. So, boy, my hand went up real fast, because that was my ultimate goal anyway. Yeah. So uh, I ended up as a second lieutenant. <laughs> and uh, by the way, I very first time I left the base, I went into Mobile and met my future wife. <laughs> but I, I, I was always a. Uh, my life has been full of all kinds of work. Kind of. I was a miner at one time. I was a commercial artist in Chicago. Uh, went to Chicago Art Institute and Chicago American Academy of Arts. Took lessons since I was about seven in art, and one of the foremost landscape artists. And so, but when it come time <laughs> to get a job, remember this is the it's towards the end of the depression, <laughs> and you were just lucky to get anything you could. So uh, uh, that's why I got in the Marine Corps anyway. Uh, I didn't know until you told me the other day. That to be a Marine, you go through the same basic training as a ground troop, uh, and the pilots do the same. In other words, they can serve in the air or on the ground. And I, I didn't realize that until you mentioned it to me. When you get into the Marine Corps, you are a Marine first, <laughs> as they tell you. So I went through about nine different schools the Marine Corps had uh, because you learn. Uh, basic platoon leader school, and then you were a uh, young staff officer school, and then you went to command and staff college, <laughs> and uh, where you got the equivalency of a master's degree in uh, military science. So uh, I probably got more schooling than, than most people have doctorates. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> lots of school. So you then you then you headed on to to the front, I suppose, and you got attached to a squadron. Well, that was a real uh, funny experience. It's something I hadn't told you before. Uh, we went through as an operational training, and then we went to El Toro. We got some more training <laughs> in uh, the plane that we flew. And then uh, it boiled down to that's uh, how I got into the squadron. But the reason I got in the squadron, VMF 313, which is a squadron that I went with overseas, uh, one night they had four planes in their flight. and. Uh, not being very sharp yet, <laughs> even though they had over a thousand hours in the air, uh, they didn't set their altimeters just right, and the whole flight flew into the ground up oh. near El Centro in the mountains there. So four of us who were going to be just replacement pilots overseas got to be in the squadron, which we went to El Centro, and then we went from there to Long Beach and got on a light uh, carrier. Uh, is what light carriers are nothing more than uh, uh, a cruiser hull. <laughs> they stopped building the cruiser and put a flat top because they needed uh, carriers over there. So uh, we went over to Hawaii on the carrier. Were these operational? Carriers? I mean, you fly yes. them? Yes. Oh, yes. Huh. So operation. Then the next thing lower is a jeep carrier, you know, and then you had the big carriers. I got in when the carriers were straight deck. They weren't the big slant deck carriers. So, but the fact that I was a uh, naval aviator, um, we had to qualify aboard a carrier every year. Even though we went operational, and I'd been operational aboard Bennington and the uh, uh, Ranger, all been retired since then. I see. Yeah. 
So you you became a member of the, what, the 313? 313, Lily Felling Packing Hellbirds, they were called. Now, what was their mission? Uh, we were primarily fighter and then they learned that we, they could put anything under our wing, so we were fighter attack pilots during the war. And, uh, went down on a small carrier from, uh, we were at Midway Island for a while, and then we came back and uh, boarded a carrier, and I went down to the South Pacific, to uh, Solomon Islands. <clears throat> And uh, we took over a little airfield on the northern end of the Solomons that blocked the, any the ships coming down in through the slot into Guadalcanal and, and uh, uh, Australia. <laughs> and uh, got to know some of the Marines down there in Guadalcanal. And they, they actually stopped Japanese, it wasn't for the Marines, <laughs> there and, go, and then turn the war around. And, uh, but we flew off to this little island in uh, Rabal, Kaviang, and airfields still had planes on them, but uh, it was getting pretty well cleaned up. So you were, you, I'll ask you an off the wall question. What was your best day? And then I'm going to ask you, what was your worst day? But first, what was, you, what was your best day that you recall? Well, my best day was in Leyte in the Philippines, where they called us in. We flew our aircraft all the way into uh, Tacloban. And uh, because MacArthur needed more airplanes there, and they had a huge amphibious force, Japanese did, coming up through uh, the Maspati Sea to retake. And so we, Marines always have to be ready in, within 48 hours. And uh, so we flew our planes all the way into the Lady. Now, while I was at Lady, uh, the very first thing we, we landed <laughs> and that day we put thousand pound bombs on our aircraft, went out to try to sink these ships coming in. And the Army Air Corps were releasing their bombs at 6,000 feet, and, <laughs> and we left. We released ours at 1,500 feet. We tried to fly right down the darn funnels of the ships. So, gosh sakes, it's been four days, uh, I think the Marines. When I refer to we, I, I mean it's the Marine Corps uh, part of it. That we had a Marine Air Group that all flew in from the uh, South Pacific to help out. And uh, so uh, we sank about 28 ships, and I don't know how many. It was in that little thing that I showed you the other day. Uh, just did, did a lot of quick and, and hard fought fight quick, but the day fine, huh? uh, but the day you, you're talking about uh, I was on a flight it went out and we were assigned certain ships to take you know you, you couldn't select your own so okay. we had three squadrons going out and our squadron was uh, assigned some of the ships and I happened to be assigned to a big uh, troop transport ship. And uh, they uh, had a flight out just before us and they uh, they wounded some of the ships, but uh, this one was still chugging along. We, we put eight f airplanes on it and uh, it, uh, it was sunk <laughs> when we got through. You have to excuse me a minute. Yeah, we, uh, I was one of the last ones down, so I lined up on the flight deck. <laughs> There's no way you can miss. <laughs> we all had circular air probables. We had a squadron. Our squadron could drop bombs within a circle air probable of 150 feet. 
that doesn't mean a lot of them went in closer than that because Marines are there for one main reason only, and that's to support our troops in close air support. So uh, that particular day we went out and uh, as we climbed up after sinking the ship, we saw a couple Oscars up there. An Oscar is a little bit faster than a Zeke, one of their fighters. But by then, the Navy had shot down all of their experienced fighters. <laughs> uh, so uh, they were just kids flying up there. But we, we climbed up and uh, was in formation. I was a wingman, but he came across this way. And he was trying to get in behind him, and I'd get, put a round through. And, scattered some pieces of the airplane and, and he's my flight leader so I just slid out on her here and he also got credit for the zero. So that was an interesting part of the day but the, the real interesting part of the day is when I got back to the airfield which was getting late in the afternoon. We had flights following going out there and uh, they said okay you're the duty officer down on the line and said, get all these planes down safely and so on. So it was, and uh, we were parked right along the end of the runway and almost <laughs> into the bay <laughs> with our airplanes. And uh, we had our revetment in there that had a, a 20 millimeter anti aircraft gun in it. <laughs> so that was. That was for the duty officers, <laughs> because just about the time we got, I got in and settled as a duty officer, they had sent over many bitty uh, kamikaze, or what do you call them, suicide planes, and this one came right over my head, <laughs> and all I could see is a big red meatball. And he missed the runway and he plowed into a bunch of P-47s, which were the next squadron up. So I had a, a real interesting time there. There were a thousand pound bombs going off there where every type of ordnance, the Japanese plane had landed right in the middle of all these airplanes that were all ready to go the, for the next flight out. So, uh, and you were duty officer that day. And I was duty officer, and I'm telling you, <laughs> it's to see that meatball cover almost on top of my head. So uh, that was an interesting night. And, and if you've seen pretty big fireworks show, you haven't seen anything until you <laughs> see about 150 or 390 millimeter artillery show. I mean, uh, air. Uh, Bomb shells. Yeah. Oh gosh, the whole place was lit up like day, <laughs> and uh, planes were coming from flying, get shot down out of the sky. Our night fighters were up, and uh, it was a very interesting day. I would turn that. You call it interesting. I would turn that as a bad day. A bad day? Yeah. Well, I, I, I did have a bad day <laughs> when we landed in Zamboango in the Philippines. And uh, I theoretically should have been killed three times, and so I, I figured that was a bad day. <laughs> I, I well, along with a good day. <laughs> squadron commander and 68 enlisted people, I, because I was buildings and grounds officer, I went in with the skipper to set up the airfield, because our planes were going to be landing on D plus three, and, and we landed. Uh, next to the beach, and I watched the whole thing. Boy, you watch an amphibious operation. It's just, and you can't even see the beach. It's just powder. They just bombarded the heck out of it. So then, in the very next, early in the morning, we got our LST up on the beach with all our gear. <laughs> and the first thing that happened, <laughs> I, uh, a long-range mortar shell landed right behind the, <laughs> the LST. I was on about 50 yards. 50 yards is not very far away. <laughs> My ordnance is going up. 
And so uh, we just got used to it. They, did, they didn't sight in very well from, you know, sight in the beach. If they had sighted the right way, we would have been wiped out all completely. But then uh, that night after we landed, we found out the, the safest place is to get out as close to the enemy as you could <laughs> because they were firing at us <laughs> on, the, on the beach and we were firing at them. So we got in the middle. <laughs> and if, if you. Uh, That's smart. If you ever heard a mortar shell, it, when it fired, you know, it's just on in a tube, so it's flip flopping to where it's going. So it goes. <laughs> Boy, when you hear it start coming down louder and louder, you know it's coming. And the darn thing landed about eight feet away from me, and it didn't go off. Oh, <laughs> so uh, he said, oh, I, I have a guardian angel sitting there. And I, said, yeah. I went through a lot of things. It, uh, it was very close. But that next day, I had six, six buys with all our gear in. And they told us, well, they're the, uh, people that clear the mines off in front of you so, so you could go. And they said, well, we're almost done. You can take your, your sh and go over to where your uh, squadron area is going to be. And uh, uh, as I got halfway down the runway, <laughs> they were waiting for us. Boy, they, the machine guns and everything else, and I had to pull my <laughs> helmet down harder over my ears and said, Kayako, that means in Japanese, get the. <laughs> and so we got down to the end of the thing. And then we had to, the skipper and I had to go back and select where we were going to go. And so I went with him, and the first thing I did is I tripped over something. Oh. <laughs> I think I told you about that. Yeah. And we went to the end. There's two five, five hundred pound <laughs> shells that were in the end, and they didn't go off. Oh, no. <laughs> I said, "Ooh, I better watch for wires around here." That was being pretty green for ground force, but uh, I, I should have been put away then. <laughs> and then that night we were going over and re reconnoitering an area and uh, a 500 pound shell, they, had, they took the, some naval guns and put them in caves way up in the mountains. And they fired down at us <laughs> and the damn <laughs> five inch shell landed all, almost next to our jeep. <laughs> Didn't go off. <laughs> I just said, hey, well, that's, two, that's, that's three of them. <laughs> that's three of them. Yeah. Oh, Lordy. Well, it's uh, that was an interesting day. <laughs> and the very next night, <laughs> they sent us up to the front lines because they're expecting a big bonsai charge, and none of us it's just set up a perimeter. <laughs> we had 38s and a perimeter. We just got in a circle. And so that that was a nice night. We, we, we cleaned up. Actually, in Zamboango, uh, we came in on an LST, which is a round bottom ship. Mm -hmm. We went through a typhoon. Everybody on that ship but me was seasick as could be. <laughs> I'd go to the, the, the mess, <laughs> and I was the only one there. <laughs> so I always kidded the guy, boy, they had good lab chops. <laughs> but that LST they have in, in the, uh, the Navy's officer's mess, a little peg that shows you how many degrees the ship is going mm -hmm. to the left and right, and it's supposed to go 45 degrees left and 45 degrees right. I think it was going boom against the thing. <laughs> I said, I wonder what it's like outside. So I went outside, and first thing I know, there's water. 
<laughs> That's all I could see. You could practically reach out and touch it, and then, and the next thing you know, you're looking right straight up at the top of the sky. How we got through, I don't know, <laughs> but it was a very interesting trip on that LST. Did you, uh, your squadron, you flew uh, support air support for U.S. convoys? Right. We. Uh, a lot of the warfare. Marine Corps, if you're given a mission to escort uh, bombers or strike planes, or you're given a mission to protect a carrier, those were the kinds of missions we were going. We, I mean, we, we knocked out all kinds of uh, railroad tunnels and, and trains up that were mainly hitting uh, uh, Mindanao, Mindanora, Mindanao, <laughs> and uh, the Big Island. And so we knocked out trains and then we escorted uh, uh, fighters uh, on missions. Uh, we did a lot of flights or missions wherein we escorted the ships went in on the uh, landings in Mindoro and then up at Lingayen Gulf uh, to, to take over those areas. So a lot of my mission read, you know, took off at so-and-so <laughs> and I flew over the carrier and returned base on so-and-so. Every once in a while they'd say they, they had a uh, bogey up in the air, so we'd go out so far, and if he turned around, we had to come right back to him, stay on over the ship. So uh, I won't say they were boring missions, but they uh, there was no combat involved. Quite as exciting as some of the others. Huh? <laughs> but it, it kept the big convoy safe. That's the main thing. And, uh, so. This is just when they started kamikaze. Hmm. And uh, so a lot of the planes we shot down uh, were flown by kids with band-aids around their head, or band bandages around their head, and, uh, and a bottle of sake, and they were to go out there and, and do as much damage as they could in the pursuit. So. Uh, Tell me about the, <clears throat> the end of World War II. You, <clears throat> what happened? Where did you go then? What did you, well, what did you do? You, I know you told me you went to Korea. Oh, that's later that, on. That, oh yeah, <laughs> later on. Uh, the uh, we were coming back from a mission to Zamboango, and uh, I guess they said, "Hey, we got good news for you, boys." He says, "You're going home." Well, we were already packing up to go to Okinawa <laughs> and go in on that landing, so we got to go back to Long Beach, California, where they put us in a ferry command to ferry beat up planes back and to fly good ones back to the carrier for replacement. So I got to fly. <laughs> you go in there and they throw a, a, a Aircraft uh, book, as you would say. I want you out here in one hour. You know, deliver these up to Whidbey Island. They, <laughs> they need them. <laughs> but he said, just get in that cockpit. You're a naval aviator. You can fly anything. <laughs> right, right. Okay. <coughs> so I flew all kinds of flight. And then VJ Day, I was flying a PBY 5A. It's a PBY that can land on land. Uh, up to Alameda, California, and the war was over. <laughs> what did you do that day? That day, came yeah. home and celebrated and... Uh, you might not want to tell us everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was fun. So, uh, anyway, that's why I flew so many airplanes. Uh, 
when you get to Floyd Bennett and drop a plane off, and they were ready to give you another plane to fly back, and <laughs> and you've never flown it before, and all cockpits are different. So you get one hour or less to learn the airplane. And actually, when you get airborne, you're looking for the darn landing gear <laughs> to pull up because they're all in different places. Finally, they standardized. We got onto the, when you write specification, let's standardize all these things where they are because uh, I mean, we can fly, but we were just. Uh, Ferry pilots. They were being done by women, by the way, uh, when the war was going strong. So <laughs> we, we took over their job. So then you were back stateside, and then uh, Korea came. No, well, when I was stateside, I, first of all, they said, you can stay in the Marine Corps or you can get out. And I decided I loved to fly, so I said, I want to stay in the Marine Corps. So they sent me off to a school in St. Simons Island, Georgia, called CIC School. It was Combat Information Center School for one year. Well, it was good, too, because I got married when I got back from overseas, naturally. <laughs> and so we had our first child. I was in Brunswick, Georgia. but. Uh, we got to be uh, CIC officers, and we got there primarily because uh, it taught you how to, as an intercept officer, who sits on the ground with a radar in front of him and guides planes in, uh, to intercept the enemy and so on. So, But we did everything that the Navy guys had to do. We, we, <laughs> we had to... Uh, CIC, little CICs and big CICs, once for carriers and this and that. And, and, but by having that knowledge, <laughs> when I got out, they sent me on TAD almost continuously aboard ship as a CIC officer. <laughs> One of the times I was Welcome a, to the military. a force CIC <laughs> officer. That means you were in charge of all the CIC and all the ships that were around you. And I think I told you that, make it real short. <laughs> One night I said, uh, Con, this is control. I said, you're on a, uh, a bunch of ships that are coming on a collision course. In other words, if the relative bearing hadn't changed in the last five minutes, and they says, well, keep a lookout for it. And for <laughs> I logged it, <laughs> just to be safe. And then the, then the bearing never changed. And uh, they said, uh, we'll, we'll take care of it up here. <laughs> this is for the skippers, the ship skipper stays. And uh, I should have moved. So I'll be darned if we didn't go right through what's called the tractor forces, LSTs and everything else. And here we are in a big amphibious. Uh, uh, command ship, the admiral of war, <laughs> and boy, he stopped that thing immediately and had to go over and show, hey, man, I, I told them they were on a collision course, it's up to them. <laughs> All the CIC does is recommend. <laughs> so that, that, I, I got on the top side and I listened, I could see the, hear the LST in, engines. <laughs> and the props going as they went through box. So I ended up, I even ended up going up to San Francisco to help the Army Air Corps guys. They, they had a, a little radar station and they didn't have any trained intercept officers, so I went up there to try and help them out. So, uh, that's just one school I shouldn't have gone to. Because <laughs> it, it took me away from flying. I was doing, I was, I was just as well have been in the Navy <laughs> as far as I was concerned. But then, uh, then Korea came along and uh, went over there in 323. I became their operations officer. And 323 was just the, uh, uh, squadron, my brother 
<laughs> flew in and shot down three or four aircraft uh, in Okinawa. You I, <coughs> I met him uh, as I was coming home. He was heading for Okinawa, so we kept <laughs> we kept the war going. Was he a Marine? He was a Marine. Aviator also? Yeah, he's two Good. years older than me, but he followed me wherever I went. <laughs> I just kept telling him, if you do this, you do this, you can do this, and you can. <laughs> he did the same thing I did. So yeah, it's, yeah, Korea was a it was a rough war. They had, you know, when you when you have two fighting forces that have all the ground equipment, tanks and and uh, long range artillery and everything, and airplanes, aircraft, and that, the aircraft was the big one, and it was really f flown by. Uh, Chinese pilots, <laughs> and uh, believe it or not, our squadron shot down three MiGs. About that. Here we were, prop job aircraft. And you know how we did it? <laughs> Is we got in what they call a Luftberry circle. It was a circle invented by the Germans in World War One. You just fly opposite each other in, in a circle, real low. Well. <laughs> The jets couldn't get at us because <laughs> we were down almost on the ground, and so they'd slow down <laughs> and try to see. <laughs> but you're covering the next plane's tail all the time, and so <laughs> the big would come down. The guy'd shoot him down <laughs> right on the ground. <laughs> so uh, that's the first time I heard of propped up airplanes uh, shooting down high performance jets. <laughs> I never got the chance. <coughs> I was operations officer, and I was off doing something else. <laughs> well, you mentioned to me about one day you were on patrol, and you used up all your ammo, but they requested some cover. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us that story. Okay. First of all, they must always say, Marines always help out their brothers no matter what. And everyone is taken out of the battlefield if it can possibly be done. So we went, uh, had four planes. Uh, there were tanks. Uh, we covered the whole front, but our Marines were primarily at the hottest spot around Pan Boom Joom, and uh, where they're having the peace talks and everything, and that's where most of the activity was taking place. Here the army was getting their pants beat off of them because the, the North Koreans were pulling in all these tanks. So we knocked out four tanks with our ATARs. That's an aerial. Uh, well, it's not a tank buster. <laughs> and so we had used all our ammunition and uh, all our heavy bombs and everything, and I got a call. There was this, we were, flight was going back, and it said, uh, anyone on this frequency, uh, please contact us. We need help now. <laughs> and so I said, uh, oh, Marines, this is Marine so-and-so and so-and-so, and, -so and, -so and I call sign. I says, uh, what's your problem? He said, we have got a lot of wounded out in front of us, and we can't get out to get them in. And uh, would you please come over and see if you can keep their heads down so we can get them out, even though you don't have any ammunition. So we got <laughs> in a line right off the ground. Have you ever heard an R2800 engine, which is a monster? That's 2,800 horsepower. It makes a racket, <laughs> and, he's, and uh, so we made about four or five passes over, and he, he says, you really saved the day, because we've got them all out now, so you can go on the home side. <laughs> and without not, firing, and then without I, firing a bullet. Uh, without firing, we just kept our heads up, boy, then, of course, they already knew that, about course here, because any time anybody had a friend said, bring those vent wing bastards out here, because <laughs> we could stay on station a long time. So about 
four years later, I went to a Marine Corps birthday ball, and I heard a little captain telling a story about the Corsairs that came in and just saved their lives. <laughs> so I went over and said, well, I happen to be leading that fight, young man. <laughs> Lord, I swear I never got so many hard dogs in my life. <laughs> yeah. That's good. Said, that, that, that was great. I said, well, Marines say Marines. I remember that. <laughs> so I had some interesting flights, <laughs> some scary flights that I didn't think I was coming back. <laughs> And after war, after Korea, you were, uh, as I recall, you were in intelligence. Uh, yeah, I, I was an intelligence operation, uh, and also I was uh, operations officer of that squadron. I remember I told you the, the the thing about Korea was the first time that. We had been cut back so far in the Marine Corps that uh, the the reservists we we call them weekend warriors because <laughs> they that's all they got were sent out to Korea <laughs> and there was only two officers in the whole squadron that were regulars and that was the CO and myself <laughs> and here I was I was senior captain then but I had four. Teen majors <laughs> that came over. And I found out uh, as an operations officer, I was always look out for my people. And, uh, and I said, uh, when's the latest time you, that you've dropped napalm? He says, we, we've never dropped napalm. I said, uh, what's your circular problem of the squadron you're in? Well, we didn't even know what I was talking about. <laughs> so, uh, I had to set up a range. <laughs> I got permission from the general to set up a range, and I'd train those boys before I'd let them go on a combat mission because, you see, fellas, we're dropping 50 yards from friendlies. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I said, I don't think you can do that. So, uh, that was, that was a, quite an experience as an operations officer. Usually, <laughs> the uh, He's a lieutenant colonel. <laughs> so that was uh, interesting. So uh, then I uh, stayed in, and uh, I did most of my duty in Washington, D.C., in Quantico, which was just outside of Washington, D.C. And I was in charge of all research and development and concepts into the five-year and ten-year plans and what the Marine Corps needed in, in the equipments, and new concepts, and new organizations, and so on. So uh, having that experience, we did a lot of uh, development work, had put out a lot of contracts. And I had a young captain working for me who was just super. He had been CEO of Force Reconnaissance People, which the SEALs were patterned after. <laughs> mm. they, they can go out of submarines and all that kind of stuff. And uh, one night he came over and he said, I had him as project officer on one, and the people that uh, owned the company were, uh, were for a drone, a battalion drone. We were developing drones long before they ever heard about drones. And so uh, he came and he said, Colonel, he says, I've been offered a job. Give me three times as much money. And uh, he said, should I take it or stay in the Marine Corps? And I said, well, PX, his name was Paul Xavier. I said, PX, I, I made you chief project engineer on every major problem I had. And I said, and you're doing, you're doing an outstanding job. All your fitness reports are outstanding. You are a fair-haired boy of the Marine Corps. You can go to be commandant if you wanted to be, if you kept your nose clean and did what you're doing now. And. Uh, I hope you stay in. 
and he did stay in. And he was the 29th Commandant of the Marine Corps, P.X. Right. Kelly. <laughs> yeah. he, he took over just when they had that horrible thing in Lebanon. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hmm. So I talked. I, I'm not saying I did. I'm, I'm saying I might have influenced him to stay in, but he did stay in. That's so. good. Yeah. So I, I was very proud of that. That's good. Yeah. So we then, then I, was I was working on a lot of uh, I, I represented the Marine Corps and, and nine different committees that were uh, had for the photography side looking radar and all kinds of uh, programs so uh, and I notice you had 14 medals. Well, I had eight, 18, but I, I had never put the, the other ones on. Okay. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. So, yeah, there were things that were given after the war was over, and, here, and uh, these were just the primary ones. Yeah. Well, we're about to end up our session. Anything you want to tell us or confess about before we shut down? <laughs> No, I'm glad I stayed in the Marine Corps because they are the best, no doubt. Yeah, <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> they have the greatest schools in the world. And e even uh, Rommel came over to our command staff college <laughs> to learn how amphibious operations really? for a whole year. Yeah, yeah really. Yeah. So anyway, I got a, a quite an education from well, Colonel, it's been quite a pleasure for me. Well, me I too. You. I'm uh, glad I got a chance to. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good to hear it. And thank you for your service. I okay. salute you. Okay, Carl. thank you. I, uh, I'm in the process of writing my biography, so I've got lots of things. I'll bring them right back over because I only live about seven minutes from here. That's uh -huh. so, good. Okay. Thank you very much. It's been very good. Thank you. Too. I've enjoyed it.